Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Your webcast will now begin. Kelly, please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly Nash, and welcome to today's webcast, Don't Get Burned, How to Use Analytics to More Accurately Rate Local Fire Responses. This event is brought to you by LexisNexis Risk Solutions and sponsored by Property Casualty 360. Before we begin, let's go over some basic housekeeping items about the webcast console. First, this event is completely interactive and incorporates many of today's social media tools. You can tweet or directly post information to your Facebook and LinkedIn pages right from the console. You don't have to open a new browser to do so. So scroll along the bottom of the screen and click on the social networking widget of your choice. In fact, we encourage you to do so. If you have a question for one of our speakers, please enter it in the Q&A widget on your console. We will get to your question during the event or during the live Q&A at the end, depending on how much time we have. We will answer as many questions as possible, so we invite you to ask away. If we don't get to your question, you may receive an email response after the event. In addition, there are some other customizable functions to be aware of. Every window you currently see, from the slide window to the Q&A panel, can either be enlarged or collapsed. So if you'd like to change the look and feel of your console, go right ahead. And finally, there will be one polling question midway through the event. When we push the question to you, please take a moment to vote, and we will read the results in real time. And now, for today's topic and the reason you are all here. As technology continues to evolve, the ability to assess fire risk is becoming more precise. By leveraging the right data, you can get a more accurate local home fire response score, helping you improve underwriting results and pricing accuracy. Here to lend insight into this topic are Ty Horn and Scott Zrebeck. Ty is Director, Home Solutions at LexisNexis Risk Solutions and has filled a variety of underwriting and product management leadership roles within the PNC industry for over 17 years. Scott is a Principal Statistician at LexisNexis Risk Solutions and is an expert in analytics. Scott has built analytic solutions for personal auto, homeowners, and commercial lines throughout his career. So without further ado, I will go ahead and now turn it over to Ty to kick off today's discussion. Ty? Ty, can you hear me? You may be Thanks, here. Kelly. Great. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's PC360 webinar. As Kelly mentioned, my name is Ty Horn, and I'm a director in the home vertical here at LexisNexis Risk Solutions. My team is tasked with bringing new and innovative property solutions to the marketplace that will allow our customers to more effectively rate and underwrite personalized property policies. You know, as mentioned, I've been with LexisNexis for about three years and spent the prior 17 years in a variety of product management and underwriting leadership roles, focusing largely on the homeowner's line of business. Today, you know, as mentioned, I'm joined by Dr. Z, who's one of our principal statisticians. Uh, Scott and his team work on R&D, specifically the development of new analytics products for use in the PNC industry. Uh, Scott has eight years of analytics experience and received his PhD in mathematics from Johns Hopkins University. Um, Scott and his team have been working diligently for the past few years developing the solution we're going to be talking about today. Ultimately, we feel this solution has the power to fundamentally transform how we think about and rate for the peril of fire by using advanced analytics uh, to more accurately rate local fire responses. Today, we're going to start off by briefly touching on the current state of fire scoring. I'm then going to give a high-level overview of our solution before Scott jumps into the weeds, providing you some of his insights into the model and demonstrating why the solution is so different. I'll then wrap things up uh, by discussing, excuse me, uh, I'm going to wrap things up by discussing how early adopters may leverage this analytical fire solution to their benefit and what would be involved in the adoption of the LexisNexis fire and disaster response score. After the introduction of the first multi peril homeowner's policy in the 50s, not much in the homeowner's space really changed until the, the 70s when the industry was introduced to fire scoring. 
Now, this was a positive step forward back in the age of Disco and the Ford Gremlin. However, much of the industry still uses fire scoring solutions that were developed back almost 50 years ago. The, uh, the prevalent solution uh, is still in use today, and it relies on distance from the rated property to the responding fire station, distance from the home to the nearest hydrant, if any is located, and survey results from the fire department. While there have been some minor scoring changes in recent years, the U.S. homeowner's market is essentially rating and underwriting for the peril of fire the same way we were back in the late 1970s. Since that time, most caregivers may have made quantum leaps forward in virtually all aspects of homeowners' rating and underwriting by introducing dozens of new rating variables, including credit, using auto insurance attributes in homeowners' pricing, building fully automated underwriting engines, and so on. Yet we have persisted in continuing to use the same fire scoring solution for five decades. Today we're going to provide you some insights into why you may want to consider taking a look at moving your homeowner's book out of the era of bad polyester suits and embrace a 21st century data-driven fire solution that will allow you to accurately underwrite and rate the peril of fire. A data-driven uh, product focuses on doing better than even the best experts to obtain an optimal solution with consistent empirical results. More importantly, a data-driven solution can achieve consistent results without the need and cost of a large field staff tasked with inspecting fire stations and hydrants countrywide. The LexisNexis Fire and Disaster, or FDR as we sometimes called it, is a data-driven product that will deliver a score of 1 to 10 to help insurers rate and underwrite for the peril of fire. Uh, to make adoption easier for all parties involved, we decided to use a, a common score out there. So we're using a score of, of 1 to 10, uh, and that will make adoption easier for agents, underwriters, your actuarial staff, and regulators. We felt that using a 1 to 10 score was logical and would be easy for everyone to grasp, even though it's likely your score will not line up with the score you see on the market today because of the radically different way in which we are determining our score. Along with the score itself, you re receive a corresponding state-specific relativity that's updated every three years. FDR is a more effective geographic-based fire-specific solution which requires fire-specific data. Data sources such as historic fire frequency and severity, uh, driving time, accounting for road complexity, uh, the legal status of the area the property is located in, population change for the area, population density, uh, pop, or, uh, per capita emergency response count, and number of paid versus volunteer uh, fire departments. I'm now going to hand this off to Dr. Z, who's going to give us some insights into why understanding and accurately rating for fire is so important. Take it away, Scott. Thank you, Ty. The way I understand how good of a a uh, solution you can get from a data-driven approach starts by understanding the depth and the width of the data. If you have the right depth, if you have the right width, you can build a good score that captures the nuances that are feasible. And what I mean by width is how much data is available to predict a target and how relevant is that data to the problem at hand. With the right predictors, you're able to, to get at the nuances, although you might not be able to find them. And that's where the second part, depth, comes in. The target itself is going to let you un unlevel the actual nuances in a systematic uh, approach and figure out what the optimal possible solution is. And once you've got those two in hand, you're going to have a new solution. Let's start by talking about the width and what you need to get at. And that really starts at, starting point for that discussion is the problem itself to determine how relevant the data is. And for fire, a fast response matters. In five minutes, under realistic but actually bad circumstances, a fire can flash over. 
you don't know what this looks like, I encourage you to Google what the videos look like. During a flash, when a fire, uh, when a fire flashes over, the spread of the fire is not limited by a burning object touching another combustible object, but rather all the objects in the room that are combustible are going to burst into flames if exposed to oxygen. Actually becoming worse um, in terms of history, historically houses were built with worse insulation and different materials and other factors like open floor plans are actually making this phenomenon worse than it's been in the past. And you see this when you look at the fire severity trends, significant and consistently increasing in the modern era. Um, these flashover events do potentially result in loss of life, loss of house. It's actually why I love insurance. Um, the concept of indemnifying a significant financial loss is why I do insurance analytics. Um, really noble field, although honestly, those firefighters who rush into the burning building, probably a little bit more noble, if I'm being perfectly honest. Five minutes is actually less time than occurs for many responses. And so there's actually more factors than that. I sometimes see people just obsessing over this five minutes factor. It's important for a fast response, so you shouldn't underemphasize it, but you can overemphasize it. Just as a simple example, I've been in two fires in my life. One was in the backyard. Myself and several Geico actuaries put it out. Um, it was not such a big deal, not result in a claim. There was another incident that occurred when I was a very little kid where the fire started inside the drywall. And this was a bigger deal. But drywall is not a combustible material like an old Christmas tree that's going to light up like a match. Um, professionals weren't used to put it out, but it would have taken considerably more than five minutes for the house to be lost. And actually, no insurance claim was filed here. When you're working with a data-driven problem, it's easy to, um, to kind of accidentally start thinking, overemphasize or underemphasizing the importance of a factor. And it's important to do neither, but let the data talk. Um, my, my boss used to have a quote, in God we trust, all others must bring data. So it's important that we have this data, it's important that we capture it, but we still need to figure out the optimal way to use it. And here's one way that you can quantify this. There's about a million fire events reported to FEMA each year. Certain factors like average fire response time are key. They are an important factor in predicting loss. This is what the data looks like for three fire stations for the Alpharetta, Georgia area. I chose this because this is where uh, LexisNexis's home office is, so it's relevant to a lot of my coworkers. These are three different fire stations inside the same fire district, but you're actually seeing market difference. They're small, but they are significant difference in terms of response time between these different fire stations, all of which, by the way, are on average worse than that five minutes that we previously talked about. In terms of performance, um, the best station and the worst station are going to have a factor that is going to result in better or worse scores. Now, here I've assigned it to fire stations. It's a very natural way of assigning it. And, you know, and, and one, when we do data science, it's always uh, relevant to assign, assign the information in the most relevant fashion. But there's actually multiple ways to assign this. Assigning it to fire station and then looking at the um, information for the address and which fire station is going to respond to it is one way to do it. Another way would just be based on region. Um, a good example in my hometown, Boulder, Colorado, our central fire station responds to events in the uh, canyons that are significantly outside the city, and the response times are much worse. And so other factors, other ways to assign this information are critical and allow you to get kind of that, that information that leads to a nuanced solution. This is just one way to do it, though, and there's other factors that you should take into consideration, factors like driving time. This is what our driving time data looks like, at least the driving time data for the near fire station for the city of Chicago. When you use the driving time, I do recommend that you look at the uh, relevant, um, realistic driving time. And you can see here, these are not perfect circles around each fire station, each fire station represented by a fire. 
which I guess means that the fire station itself is on fire. Um, those little red dots are the fire stations themselves. The lighter areas around them are those areas which a fire truck can rapidly respond to, whereas the, as you get further away, you get into darker regions. Make this realistic. Um, I think it should be assumed that the fire trucks aren't going to fly, so they're going to follow roads. In fact, we're even finding that adjusting for road complexity, your intersections, is to help improve the quality of your data in terms of width. It's a more relevant solution to the problem, so it's something that I recommend you do for yourself if you're going to build a data-driven approach. I actually chose this map because Chicago is really cool. Um, there's a lot of fire stations. This predictor is actually most relevant in rural areas. Um, it's, it's quite common to have a rural area that's either good or bad. Um, and, you know, current time is one type of factor that goes into that consideration. It's very easy to have a career fire station in a small town um, that does a very good job of protecting the area. In contrast, though, um, driving time is kind of a worst case or a best case scenario. And if you're significantly further from the fire station than, say, five minutes, say, 10 minutes away, that is the sort of factor that does lead to worse fire stations. These are important factors, um, but they're not the only ones. And one that's often neglected and very relevant when we move to a data-driven approach rather than, say, an opinion-based score of a fire station, even an expert opinion, would be something like the following. What you're looking at here is average loss of severity for the Philadelphia area. This is an important counterfactual rating element, areas that historically uh, have high losses tend to, in the future, have high losses. Now, there's a lot of factors that need to be taken into consideration when you use such a factor. We actually smooth this using hierarchical credibility theory. And it's used in a data-driven product will differentiate it from other products. Now, sometimes, now I guess it's worth mentioning a few things. If you're used to looking at maps, you're going to notice that there's strong patterns there. There's dark pink areas, there's light green areas, and there's yellow areas, and there's general trends that make this look like it's not just statistical noise. Ultimately, the look of it is not going to determine the um, use of the data. We're again going to test it. We're going to make sure that it's a data-driven approach to determine just how important this particular is. And now, Worth mentioning that this sort of predictor often confuses people. You want to be using past loss data to predict future claims. For our analysis, we used average loss data as it would have looked like as of New Year's Eve on 2012. In fact, there was even a little bit of a buffer, so it was before New Year's Eve 2012. And then used it to predict losses that occurred in 2013 and after. This is exactly how, exactly the situation you're going to be when you go to underwrite a new policy. There's another thing that I should remark on. Anytime you're looking at statistics, there's a balancing act that you have to do. Intrinsically, there's volatility or precision and specificity or accuracy. Now, we actually have a little bit of a depth advantage, but anyone can build such an attribute. Um, you'll just need to use a slightly less fine region, and you may have data biases that you need to overcome, regions that aren't populated in your data as well. But there's approaches to do this, and it is an important variable in building the right solution. Now, this is three of kind of my favorite variables. But we actually considered a whole host more. We don't have time to dig into them one at a time. I can, broadly speaking, talk about the groups. I don't think it's going to surprise anyone that the makeup of a department matters in terms of having fire losses. Volunteer firefighters, volunteer fire stations can have issues. I talked to a rural New Hampshire volunteer firefighter, and she talked about working in one town, town B, and being a volunteer firefighter in town A. In the event that she was the primary responder, she would have to go back to town A pick up the gear, and then respond. 
um, she actually said something that really sticks with me, that in such an event, you're not protecting the house, you're protecting the door to the basement because the house is going to burn down and you're really preventing the fire from spreading beyond that. This is a factor that's very important in identifying, say, a good rural fire station versus one that's going to struggle in terms of preventing insurance losses. Other factors might include things such as fire department stress. It's kind of the opposite side that I tend to find in the data. Um, in certain areas, like uh, Atlanta, you might have your fire station responding to EMS calls. Your non-fire um, emergency response is really what I mean by that, you know, your paramedic type issues. Um, talk to another firefighter who mentioned repeatedly responding to complications that the same person, person with diabetes had. Um, this sort of factor can predict future losses, and it is predictive and something you might want to consider. Other factors include things like adequacy of department funding, whether or not you're in an incorporated area. A really cool variable that's actually not useful or I wasn't able to use it would be weather. Um, we, we created a really cool element that where the moisture content of wood and the days of an extreme drought. Um, I'll give you a hint, it, uh, it ends up being Arizona, uh, is the areas that are affected by this. It just was not predictive, even though I wanted it to be predictive. Um, so it's sometimes sometimes you try really hard um, and fail, and that's kind of fun. Kind of makes coming into work interesting and a uh, challenge. But it's very useful. Another useful variable um, that I wouldn't necessarily have known about, and if I just wrote down what I thought was predictive of uh, fire losses would be the geography and topography, relative elevation, how level the area is. Um, it's very easy to come up with possible explanations, effects of dry, on driving time, that sort of thing. Um, but what is true, uh, even though I'm not sure exactly why, is these are important factors that do affect losses. Now, in addition to this, we also talked about different factors, such as control factors. Any data-driven approach has to be useful. Um, when we're trying to predict losses, we're also trying to come up with a solution that is going to more accurately associate risk. And there's certain factors, like coverage A, you know, the amount of insurance that a particular house has isn't obvious, obviously relevant to the cost it takes to rebuild a house that burns down. Um, and so we want this to be incremental. Any solution has to be incremental, but beyond these factors, which my peers in the industry are really doing well, so there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. Let's just build a better vehicle around it. I've kind of talked a lot about data. Uh, there's a lot of data that I love here, but um, I kind of want to ask you guys what you guys love the most. And let's bring up our first question, or first and only question. Great, thanks, Scott. Yeah, so we've come upon our first polling question. Um, we'd like to pause and get thoughts from everyone joining us today on the following. Uh, which of these three predictors do you find the most compelling? Average fire response time for the fire district, driving time accounting for road complexity, or historic fire frequency and severity? We'll give a couple moments for everyone to respond. Okay, we have a vast majority saying historic fire frequency and severity. Uh, Scott, do you want to speak to that answer? Yes, absolutely. So I agree. I, I think that this is the most important factor. The, these sort of loss statistics um, empirically are the most um, um, important predictors, and it, it is a major factor in getting the, the um, score correct. Now, honestly, these these numbers kind of agree with the model. So the model thinks that historic losses um, are are the most predictive, then average fire response time, and then driving time. And these other factors like driving time actually are critical because they do give a very bad situation. Um, but um, the number one predictor is, as people expect, historic fire frequency and severity.
Okay, now let's talk about what goes into a data-driven solution. Now, this is where depth comes in. I, I love talking about width because it, it's kind of fun to figure out what drives the losses. It, it, it's really part of why I'm a data scientist. But to actually build the model, um, what, we're found, what we found best is focus on the fire severity part of it. Fire is fundamentally a severity-based um, phenomenon. And to do this, you need depth, right? Um, the, and you need depth because there's a high coefficient of variation of severity. What this means in practice is that fire losses are driven by very bad high high pay loss amounts that are driving the losses, even though the frequency is actually quite low. In fact, the average severity for our data set was over $60,000. And to do this, the easiest way to fight this is in terms of claims volume. The more claims you have, the better. Um, we were able to use a quarter of a million claims. Um, and we're also using claims that have finished developing, non-catastrophic. We don't want to be measuring these um, wilderness wildfires. Um, there's better ways of doing that, actually. But, um, and not only that, there's any time you build a, a lot of machine learning models or uh, statistical models, you want all of the events to be kind of independent. You, you, you don't want a swath of very similar houses to burn down because it's not really new information. We're also using closed paid claims. So we've got development already taken into account. And we're in particular using losses from the time period from 2013 to 2015. I recommend you do this. Um, realistically, there's a little bit of a fight that's going to go on in terms of getting the claims volume. The more volume you have, the better and more nuanced your, your solution can be. Um, and so, you know, you, you got to balance, balance and do a balancing act between claims volume and also pertinence to recent losses. One of the things you also should be aware of is make sure that it's representative of the whole industry. There's a variety of approaches to do this. Um, there's approaches like reweighting that can take a bias set and make it uh, representative of the whole industry. Uh, AlexisNexis are kind of a little bit lucky in a certain sense because I start having the whole industry of losses. Other thing, any data-driven approach has to work um, on data that it has not seen. I kind of am oversimplifying this. In a broad sense, we use a 50% training data set, a 25% test data set, and a 25% holdout sample. I'm oversimplifying that because I actually don't like starting with using all training data set. You can only use more information. Um, in fact, our earliest models were built, I think, on 18.5% of the data, They're just a small portion of the first 25% of the training data. So you can always, you know, ultimately, when you, when you look at the test data, it's cheating. Um, and so you don't want to cut down on looking out on the test data. And when you do that, you're going to guarantee that the holdout performance is good. Let's talk to the, about the structure of the solution itself. We're using machine learning on a severity target. Severity is where fires, um, where fire and where the community's response to a fire matters most. Um, I like to sometimes oversimplify this and say that a firefighter is not going to prevent you from having that kitchen fire unless they're standing behind you, um, which is some sort of weird Fahrenheit 51 style firefighter. It's not the exact same thing. But community's prompt response will, will help mitigate the loss severity, and it is in a quantifiable way. We are using machine learning. We're finding that, oops, we are finding that that is the best performance. In fact, you can still do this in the insurance setting because you can have controllable logic, logical monotone relationships that you're imposing, in, um, but you can get better performance by using machine learning over GLMs. And actually, one of the more interesting things that about a machine learning type target or type approach is it allows you to fail fast. And I love failure. I, I do it all the time um, mm. because it helps me learn. Um, in pr particular, it helps you test kind of alternate approaches. You know, there's very good approaches. Using a Tweety distribution on loss cost 
is great. It, you are going to get a good solution. But maybe if you try a different distribution, you're going to get a better or worse response. And one of the factors of using kind of machine learning on just a small sample of the test of the training data is it lets you figure out what approaches are going to work the best. Most importantly, we got our eyes on the prize. Well, we're building a model to look at the geographic relationship of buyer. We want it to make sure that it's incremental over existing pricing, and you need to do the same. Um, now, we're actually using control scores for that to predict the loss severity. But um, you know, if you do this yourself, you can focus on your own scores that are already in your predictive models. The scores you're using, the premium you're using, um, you know, sort of a loss ratio type approach. It's critical to make sure that you're not double counting and that your score is going to be incremental and improve what you can do. The net effect of using G, uh, gradient boosting over GLMs is a significant improvement. Um, broadly speaking, I tend to see a 15 to 20% improvement in performance by switching to machine learning approaches. And actually, there's another metric here, this little remark that's largely uncorrelated with market value. Certain factors that I've talked about actually are correlated with the coverage A of a house or the market value of the house. Our, our final score has essentially zero correlation with market value. I'm exaggerating, nothing's zero correlation in reality. Uh, the correlation, in fact, is 2.6%, almost nothing in terms of correlation. In fact, when we looked at GLMs, we were seeing a high, significantly higher correlation of market value. And that's really where I see these sort of machine learning approaches um, improving on the pricing. You're kind of missing, missing kind of an effect that you don't want to have in order and getting a stronger result to begin with. One thing we're doing and one thing I would recommend you to do when you look at your data-driven approach is we're including unscorable observations. Observations where we're detecting no fire protection. Now, when I look at this on our one to 10 scale, um, on a large book of about eight carriers, the unscorables were scoring a value equivalent to the nine and a half. They're, they're scoring, in terms of empirical performance, they're doing very bad. but you know, there's kind of a difference between um, not detecting any fire presence, uh, fire protection, and knowing for sure that it is bad fire protection. So this is ultimately um, kind of generic. Let's look at results. What you're looking at is a loss severity relativity games chart. So in particular, the y-axis here is loss severity divided by a GLM prediction to simulate um, how the severity would be priced for in the market. For any particular carrier, it's wrong, but for the general market, it would be a pretty good estimate and it's useful to help, um, help it make it so that when you do your analysis, the score is truly incremental above and beyond. On your x-axis, you're seeing death counts. Each particular bucket is 10% of the claims. Going from left to right, you're getting higher scores. So in particular, your bin one policies are coming in at 64% um, of the average loss severity relativity. And this is a good result because you're finding policies with significantly lower risks. And it's also a good res result because you're seeing strong, consistent segmentation. Another thing when we talk about depth, you know, the more claims you have, the, the more stable these sort of graphs are going to look like, the more stable these predictions are. Um, so that's also a factor and something to keep in mind. It doesn't mean that you couldn't, say, decrease the number of deciles if you had um, you know, a quarter of as many claims. Look at five bins, and you should get a decent result. Now, I'm using deciles, and our score is not deciles. But I'm using that for an important reason. Deciles is kind of a way that an analyst is going to look at the, the data. Equal bins, equal weight everywhere. You can see how the performance is, how it varies across the whole population. Um, actually, as an analyst, I prefer Lorenz curves. Those are, tend to be way too technical, even though you can get much more information. Um, actually, if you want to switch to Lorenz curves, um, uh, it, I highly recommend it, because you can get a lot more detailed information than from a game's chart. I'm getting off track. Let's get back uh, to the 
presentation. Use a model, you have to take into account the considerations of the industry. And we are a regulated industry, regulated at the state level. So in particular, you want to make sure your score is good in terms of the state or state group. Um, and this is what the results look like for our Texas data set. Your y-axis here is similar to before. It's loss severity relativity, with the one exception being that in addition to our control score, we are now including an, an adjustment so that it's Texas losses. Um, this is important just to guarantee that the distribution is good, this nice bell curve. Those blue bars represent how many policies are in each bin, each fire, disaster, and response score. And when you build your own data-driven approach, I recommend you take the same approach. You want to be able to segment the best. You want to be able to segment the worst. And you're going to have more policies in the middle that are roughly average priced, which makes sense. Um, now, I want to actually focus a little bit on this. And even when you have a lot of depth, when you start cutting the data, you do start seeing noise. In particular, our BIM 10 policies are predicted to have a 58% uh, loss severity relativity. In this case, they only, there's only about 130 claims in that particular BIM, and we got a little bit lucky. And we see that, on average, empirically, the BIM 10 policies had 200% of the average loss severity. Um, honestly, that's a little bit lucky. Realistically, it should have been about 58% with um, consistent segmentation from 64% to 158%. Now, Gaines charts, um, there's, I always try to do a like white gauge chart, but I never seem to be able to do it. Ultimately, there's only one way of understanding a score. Um, I think another important way to understand a score is to look at maps. This is a geographic product. Um, this is a geographic phenomenon. So um, when you look at the maps, you can get an insight into how the score actually works. So this is two counties in Georgia. The counties that we chose, because they're actually both very similar, both are very rural counties, both are, um, both historically actually have below average losses, at least when we looked at it um, for the historic time period. But they do receive significantly different scores. In particular, Harris County, receives a lot of very high scores, whereas Camden County doesn't. So the real question is why? Right? Um, digging into the data, it was pretty clear very early on what's going on here. The average fire response time for Harris County was six to 15 minutes, whereas Camden County was three to eight minutes. And this kind of created much lower scores for Camden County than Harris County. You don't see the purple blobs, which are the higher scores, as opposed to the green blobs that are present in Camden. These blobs, which I don't think is a technical term, but um, I'm going to still use, um, these blobs aren't, yeah, it's not a single color on each of these counties. And that's kind of important when you build a score. And it's a feature, really, of a data-driven product. The score is actually going to vary um, within district, within county, and that's a good thing. That lets you get at the nuances to the extent that it's predictive. And the predictions we've already seen are quite strong. Uh, let's look at the next example, which is the Houston area. Uh, one second. This is a map of the Houston area. As before, your purple areas are your significantly higher risk areas. Um, your yellow areas are your, your average areas, and your green areas are below average risk. See a large purple swath around the northeast border of this map? That is a large area, but it actually doesn't account for too many observations. That's, in fact, only about 3% of the properties in the Harris County end up with a score of, or an FDR score, or a fire disaster response score of 10. Likewise, when you're Using a data-driven approach, you're going to see a variety of areas, like, for example, the woodlands, or the western half of Houston inside the innermost beltway that are performing better than the surrounding areas. And this is 
exactly what you want. You want to be able to get at the nuances of the data and when building a data-driven approach. Now let me pass it back to Ty, because he's going to describe one way you may benefit from implementing a data-driven score and talk about some of the next steps that we're going to see. Thanks, Scott. On the screen, you can see a simple example of how FDR would allow you to identify the better risks on the left, as well as the policies on the right that are currently underpriced. When implemented, FDR would allow you to accurately identify and both underwrite and rate policies based on their overall fire risk. This is very important when you consider that fire accounts for 28% of all non-CAT homeowner insurance losses. As Scott mentioned earlier, uh, when fires do happen, they're very severe, with the average loss being just over $60,000. Early adopters of FDR will also benefit from getting ahead of the market and will be able to identify policies that are less risky and begin to offer attractive pricing that their competitors are still unable to identify. Conversely, they can identify and write price or underwrite against properties that are outside of their underwriting appetite, adversely selecting against the competition. So I think it's safe to say that the LexisNexis Fire and Disaster Response Score is a bit different. And I believe that we've been able to show that the data-driven solution is superior to an opinion-based score for a variety of reasons. Our state-specific fire and disaster response score shows strong, consistent lift, and will provide you with additional segmentation within your book by accurately rating individual properties, providing intradistrict variation. We're using the latest technology, not opinions, to provide an up-to-date score with no split classifications, greater segmentation, and more top-to-bottom lift. As you make plans to find out more about the LexisNexis Fire and Disaster Response Score, you should keep in mind that customer testing is currently available. Um, we'd be happy to work with carriers to help you show what kind of lift and disruption you can expect in your book of business, uh, keeping in mind that disruption is good. Um, we think that your book will be disrupted for all the right reasons, but you've got to have a plan to deal with that. So, so we'd like to get in front of that and help you put together a plan to implement. Filing efforts are currently underway. So we've already prepared filing packets to support individual carrier filings to introduce the LexisNexis Fire and Disaster Response Score. In addition to this, we will begin our former filing efforts later this month, uh, including some filings in some of the larger homeowner insurance markets such as California, New York, Texas, Florida, and Pennsylvania. Uh, we also do have a dedicated uh, resources to help you answer departmental questions that you may receive about your fire and disaster response uh, score filings. Interactive delivery. Um, so the fire and disaster response score will be interactively available in the first quarter of 2019. It will also be available via the LexisNexis insurance portal for customers who prefer that delivery method. Uh, finally, you should keep in mind that you know, customers who currently order any products from LexisNexis will greatly benefit from our single point of entry which will greatly simplify your adoption efforts from a technology perspective. Scott, I truly appreciate your participation today and would now like to take uh, any questions that you may have about the LexisNexis Fire and Disaster Response Corps. Yes, thanks, Ty. So we, we do have some time left in the hour, um, and there are several great questions that have come in from the audience. Um, the first one being, how often will the model need to be updated? Scott, maybe that's the question that's best suited for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so fire, fire stations are always changing. There's new fire stations coming on. There's even cases with them closing down. The underlying data is going to be updated every year. So every year you will see um, information that is pertinent to the most recent information in terms of fire responses. In terms of the model itself, we're expecting you know, more on the order of a five-year timetable. And then 
it will be updated in a way that is done to minimize disruption. Okay, great. Um, another question we have is, uh, where, where are you with findings? Will DOIs accept a GBM-based score? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, so obviously, every DOI is going to have their own different criteria. Um, so Ty actually just covered that at the end. But um, the, we're actively doing some of the filings right now, and we're going to work with um, all of the DOIs to guarantee that the solution is, is um, acceptable to the DOI in an appropriate format, which in some cases may involve some modification of the score itself, but hopefully not too much, because ultimately this is not unfairly discriminatory. We need very pertinent information to develop a very good rating system. Okay, um, a few more questions to, to go. Uh, next one is, how often will fire stations be updated? Oops, we actually got that one. <laughs> um, so fire stations will be updated every year. Okay, great. Um, could, could this product be used for commercial purposes? I can jump in and take that one if you'd like, Scott. Sure, absolutely. So this product was developed specifically with uh, residential properties in mind. That being said, we would love the opportunity to work with a carrier uh, to test their commercial book of business. Uh, so if there are any commercial carriers out there who are interested in learning more about what a test would look like, uh, please contact Scott or I. Okay, great. Um, and how often are new relatives provided? Take that one, Bob. Sure. So updated relativities will be delivered back to the carriers every three years. All right. Um, there's a few more to go. I think we have some time left. We do. Uh, okay. Our score is determined by zip code or property latitude and longitude. Uh, it, it's not determined by zip code. It's definitely determined by lat long. So the underlying data is based on a variety of factors. You know, you're, as you different, go to a different, say, responding area, you're going to get associated with different fire stations. And all of that is geographic in nature, so it's truly based on lat long. Um, the way we're doing this in terms of implementing the score, uh, we're using our geocoder, so all you will be doing is providing a um, address, and then we will standardize um, and produce a lat long and then use that to associate the appropriate score. All right, great, thanks, Scott. Uh, the next question here we is, is sort of lengthy, and uh, there's a couple questions here in one, so here we go. Uh, for, for companies using GLMs to evaluate their pricing, do we need to adopt machine learning methodologies to adjust our rates for the fire severity signal that you are identifying in your fire score? Otherwise, we're duplicating no. the fire severity inherent in our pricing? Uh, we're trying to make this, um, intentionally make this um, independent. Well, obviously, that's a impossible task that can't be done in general, but the score t will tend to be independent from other non-geographic rating elements. And by doing that, you're going to really have a new predictor that you can use inside your GLM framework. So if you have a say a fire loss severity model, you can use that then as a predictor. Likewise, if you have a loss cost, severity, or loss cost model, um, you should also be able to use it. I think there might be some mild correlation with say a frequency model, but if, if I'm being totally honest, I'm, I think it's just minor and probably coincidental. So I probably wouldn't, I would try it there because you, know, you might as well try anything. Uh, but I, I would not necessarily expect it to be present for your frequency GLM. Uh, and in particular, you could use this, I suppose, in a, uh, a GBM, but we're expecting it to be used more in terms of GLMs. OK, uh, so lots of great interaction here. There's a couple more questions. Uh, are you integrating hydrant locations? We don't have hydrant uh, information uh, countrywide per se. We are incorporating other factors such as um, fire department. Okay, and we'll 
make time for uh, for one more question. Are response times from fire boats included for homes on the shores of lakes and oceans as well? <laughs> that is a very nuanced question. Um, I am not sure. I would have to go back to how the data was processed. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, we're, we're getting close to the hour mark at this time. Um, so I want to thank you very much, Ty and Scott, for your insights today, as well as a Property Casualty 360 for their support. We'd, of course, like to thank everyone for joining us. We hope this discussion was useful to you. Uh, please note you will receive an email notification when the archived webcast is available for reference. So thank you again, and have a great afternoon.